Today, we're going to talk about some of the accessory parts of the integumentary system. Okay, and the first one is going to be hair. So as we can see here, we have the epidermis, we have the dermis, and essentially what is epidermis that has been pushed down into the dermis, this is a hair follicle. Okay, and within the hair follicle grows the hair, where uh, pretty much just like in the epidermis, cells are dividing actively down here. And as new cells are formed, they're being pushed up okay, and out. Uh, and closely associated with the hair follicle are sebaceous glands, so glands that release oil, as well as erector coli muscles. Okay, so the hair follicle is this structure right here. It's essentially a pocket of epidermis within the dermis. Okay, so at the base here, um, in what, what is called the hair bulb, so the very bottom, um, where these cells are closest to the blood supply that you know, pokes up um, in this essentially this little depression in the hair follicle, um, supplying the cells here with nutrients and gases and things that they need to be able to uh, undergo mitosis pretty um, steadily. Okay, so these cells are actively dividing. And as they divide and create new cells, that's going to push up the oral ones. So the hair root is essentially from here all the way down to the base. It's the entire portion of hair that is within skin. Okay, so within this hair fall. The hair shaft is whatever you would see protruding from the skin. So you know if you have a, a buzz cut, it would be pretty short, pretty small amount of hair. If you have long hair, it would be much longer. So the hair shaft is just whatever is coming out of the skin. So hair grows, um, as, as I was showing you before, from the base. Okay, the cells that are up here are not actively dividing. So all of the division is happening in the stem cells down here um, near the blood source. Okay, so since they're near the blood source, they're well nourished, and that's what gives them the ability to divide pretty often. So as the new cells are being produced, the older cells are being pushed up. As they get pushed up, they get farther and farther away from the blood source. Um, and not only that, they're going to continuously be adding more um, keratin proteins um, to themselves. And essentially, it's the same idea as what happens up here uh, as, as the cells um, get older and get pushed up in the epidermis. Okay? If they're getting farther away from the blood vessels, um, they're keratinizing, keratinizing yes. and um, they are eventually going to die. So pretty much, once the, once the hair gets up to here, the cells are done. Okay, they're full of keratin, they're no longer um, alive in the body. So hair growth um, happens in cycles. So it's usually about a two to six year cycle. So a hair will grow, um, if you let it, for two to six years. Um, so that means that if a hair grows for six years, it could be very, very long before its um, life cycle is over. So it grows for two to six years. Once that cycle is over, then the hair follicle essentially rests for two or three months, so it stays there. Um, then it's going to get um, essentially pushed out by a new hair. So underneath the old hair, a new one is going to start growing. It's going to push the old one out. And so it's natural if your hair falls out, okay? So don't freak out if your hair is falling out. That's natural. The problem is, is when it doesn't grow back, right? So just because you are losing hairs, that's normal um, for everybody, but when it doesn't grow back, that's when hair loss happens. Okay, so if it is not being replaced, then 
Unfortunately, that means that that follicle will no longer have a hair and hair loss is, is happening. Okay, so we already talked about melanocytes and melanin. Now, melanin is also produced in hair. That's what gives hair its color. Um, and there are a few different genes that determine hair color. And really what is going to um, affect hair color uh, are two different types of melanin. Okay, so there's what is called eumelanin, which is the melanin that we talk about in the skin that produces a brownish black pigment. Okay, so if you have a lot of eumelanin, then that means that your hair is going to be pretty dark. Um, but there's also a different type of melanin called theomelanin, which produces a red yellow color. So your hair is going to have some combination of these two, right? Maybe a lot of one and not a lot of another. Um, maybe maybe a good bit of both, right? But you know, if somebody has a lot of melanin, then their hair is going to be pretty dark. If somebody has a lot of theomelanin and not really any melanin, then their hair is going to be pretty red. Okay. So obviously, this is just an advertisement for hair color. This one's not so normal. Nobody really has uh, green hair naturally, but you know, you could have very dark black hair, um, more of a brown, brunette color, red hair, brown hair, those are all natural. Okay? But green, not so much. Okay, if somebody has albinism, meaning that they are albino, um, their hair, as well as their skin will lack any type of melanin. Right? So their hair will look white. And that's essentially what happens when somebody's hair starts going gray. It's just that the pigments are not being produced anymore. Okay. So manipulation of the hair follicle, essentially moving the hair up and down, um, is going to be done with the erector pili muscle. And that's what we can see here. So it's attached to the epidermis, the bottom of the epidermis, as well as the hair follicle. So when this contracts, it's going to pull the hair follicle up slightly. Okay, so when it contracts, it makes the hair stand on end, okay, it makes a goose bump, um, essentially grazing the hair up a little bit, it gives you a little bit of a, of a bump looking there. Um, and in the past, it had a, an actual function for helping with thermal regulation, um, but over the um, you know, thousands of years through evolution, as humans uh, pretty much lost a lot of the hair that they would have like all over their body, this function became less and less useful because what it does is if the hair is uh, much more dense when these stand on end that helps to trap warm air um, between these hairs and the skin so that prevents um, as much heat loss if you are cold. All right, next accessory we have is nails. Okay, so this is a protective covering at the end of your fingers and toes, very hard, rigid. Um, so you have what is called the nail bed, and this is just the skin underneath your nail. So you look at my nail, it would be underneath the uh, skin. Uh, this, it would be the skin underneath the nail, okay? and it's continuous with your epithelium. The nail plate is the nail itself. Okay, so it is the the hard part of your of your of the end of your finger, the, what you and you think of as the actual nail. That's what the nail plate is. It lies over the skin. The cells are still at the very of cells, but they are keratinized and they form very hard plates. And if you look at your finger, especially like at your thumbs, you'll be able to see what is called the lunula, which is essentially like the white portion right at the base of the nail. Um, not, not the end of the nail, Okay, where you would normally cut with nail clippers. I'm talking about at the base. So it looked like kind of like a half moon. Um, and this is where the, the nail is actively growing within the roots. Okay, so 
this is the lunula right here, um, right at the base of the nail. You have the free edge, this is what you would normally be cutting off. The nail plate is the actual nail itself. The nail bed is just the skin. Okay, so it's, it's essentially what is being protected by the nail above it. Um, and the cuticle is the region of the skin that is overlying your, your nail. So there you go. Now we get to the glands. We're going to talk about four different glands here. The first one that we have here is this coiled shaped looking one. It looks like a ball of yarn almost. And this is a sweat gland. Okay, so sweat glands are American glands. Um, they, they are called, they are sudoriferous glands. Um, that's just the technical name for sweat glands. Um, so they are um, ball shaped, coiled glands. So they they're not branching, it's just really highly oiled like this. And the cells down here secrete sweat, right? So they're secreted through a duct. So this is an exocrine gland. And uh, sweat is composed of mainly water, but also some salts and wastes, including urea and uric acid. So this is the same type of stuff that you would be releasing through your urine, right? which is why your urine is called urine. Uh, but uh, your sweat is, is mainly composed of water, salt, and these wastes. Okay, and obviously here, um, th there are actually a few different reasons for your uh, sweat glands to release sweat. Okay, so the first one that we have is called the eccrine gland. That's what we see here. So an eccrine gland; these are the most numerous sweat glands in your body. They respond to elevated body temperatures. So they will be activated when you're too hot, release sweat through the, the pore here, and uh, that's going to leave that liquid on the surface of your skin. And when it evaporates, it's going to take heat away from your skin and help to cool you down. Okay. So they're especially common um, on your forehead, on your neck, and on your back. So when you're hot, this is where you are essentially going to start sweating. So there are another type of gland, uh, sweat glands known as African, African glands. And, oops, sorry. So these actually are going to secrete um, fat and proteins within the sweat as well. Um, and when these things react with skin bacteria, so bacteria that are living on the surface of your skin, not bad bacteria, um, mind you, but just bacteria that's living, um, it's the flora on, on the surface of your skin. When these bacteria react with the fat and the proteins, it's going to create a, uh, a scent. Okay, so your eccrine glands, they don't create a scent, the African glands do. So these sweat glands are activated at puberty. So this is why, like back in middle school, um, before everybody started wearing deodorants, why people smell, smelled like BO. Okay. This is what pr produces body odor. Um, so when this sweat, when it is released and it reacts with the skin bacteria up here, that's gonna produce that body odor scent, okay? And you will, you will secrete these um, products when you are under stress, okay? So if you're emotionally upset, frightened, or in pain, or even when you're exercising, the set of sweat will be released. So, um, these, these sweat glands are most numerous in your axillary region, so your armpits, and in the groin, and this is the reason why you put deodorant on, right? So, if you can stop that smell, um, you do. So, you, you put deodorant in your armpits, which will help to either mask that scent or prevent you from sweating in the first place. Okay, so next, pass through our, um, uh, our hair follicle here, our sebaceous glands, or oil glands. Okay, so these are specialized epithelial cells again. They are um, gonna be connected to your hair follicles. They release sebum, which is just 
oil, essentially, so it's fatty material as well as um, cellular debris. And they're secreted into the hair follicles, and this oil helps to nourish your hair, keeping it soft and pliable and uh, ideally waterproof as well. So sebaceous glands are actually responsible for acne. So if an excess amount of sebum is produced, um, or if inflammation is, is occurring in these glands, um, that is going to lead to the formation of acne. So the, essentially the glands become plugged, as I said, the, the duct becomes plugged, and that's going to, uh, will be, that's going to um, result in the formation of blackheads or pimples. And then finally, we have our two last ones. So these are modified sweat glands. And the first one we have is going to be within your um, external auditory canal in your ear. And these are called ceruminous glands and they produce earwax. Okay, so the earwax helps to trap dust, helps to prevent pathogens from getting all the way to your eardrum, right, where it can cause an ear infection. And our other one that we have here is a, is, are the mammary glands, and they are located in the mammary region in the breasts, and they're um, going to secrete milk in response to hormones, um, and the milk will help to nourish a newborn baby. Okay, so at this point, we are done with the hair, the nails, and all the glands. So these are all of the accessory um, parts of the integumentary system that I wanted to talk about. So at this point, we're pretty much done with the anatomy. Now we're gonna talk a little bit more about physiology um, with the rest of this chapter. Okay, but that is all for today. Make sure that you upload your notes and have a nice day.